uh, Professor Dugar, let's use this opportunity to move to the second topic that I would like to discuss with you, which is the basically the plight of the Palestinians. Yes. Um, could you describe for me maybe first as a way to introduce this and also you, um, your own experience with apartheid, because you were born in 1936 and you grew up in apartheid South Africa. Um, what was that experience like uh, being part of the privileged minority? How did it how did it impact you and and uh, your view on on this crime of apartheid? Well, as you rightly point out, I grew up as a privileged person in apartheid South Africa, as a white person and as a male. So uh, I was privileged on two counts. Uh, but when I was growing up, it became clear to me that South Africa was engaging in an aggressive form of race discrimination. Uh, the, the general or a view which is sometimes uh, held is that only black South Africans were opposed to apartheid. That's not true. Uh, many white South Africans were uh, opposed to uh, the policy of apartheid. Uh, many uh, white South Africans were convicted of crimes against the apartheid state and served long terms of imprisonment. So there was opposition in the white community to uh, apartheid. Uh, my parents, for instance, had uh, both taught on a, uh, in a missionary school. Uh, they taught black students. So uh, my father was principal of a school which Nelson Mandela attended. So I came from what might be described as a liberal background, which uh, my, my parents both uh, accepted that it was important to uh, advance the cause of equality in South Africa. And, and that was the way I was brought up. And uh, when I moved to the University of Witwatersrand, I was in a an environment in which uh, there was general hostility to the policy of apartheid. The university was institutionally opposed to apartheid. Uh, the university had initially been open to all races, uh, Nelson Mandela, for instance, was a student at our law school. Uh, but then the National Party government introduced the policy of apartheid and universities were obliged to uh, become segregated. So there were white universities and black universities. But the University of Witwatersrand was strongly opposed to this. And every year, we as an institution committed ourselves to the abolition of apartheid in university education. So uh, there was a lot of opposition to uh, apartheid. I, in my later years, uh, directed uh, a, uh, a human rights body called the Centre for Applied Legal Studies, which engaged in uh, human rights litigation, advocacy, research. And so uh, I grew up in South Africa, opposed to the policy of apartheid, and I used my legal skills for what they were to uh, advance the cause of equality in South Africa. And we uh, saw this come to fruition in 1994. Practical question. How does one use the legal system in a country where the legal system is created to enforce apartheid or to, to enforce unjust laws and not just for 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 the case of, of South Africa you know there's a general question in an unjust state with unjust laws how does one use the justice system to advance uh, the good cause well South Africa was probably unique in the sense that we had a statutory body of law which uh, provided for racial discrimination and segregation. That was the law of apartheid. But on the other hand, we had our common law, our customary law, uh, which we had inherited from uh, the Netherlands and from England, called the Roman Dutch law, which was a relatively enlightened, progressive system of law. And so uh, it was possible to argue that the strict laws of apartheid statutory laws 
should be interpreted in a more benevolent uh, manner. And uh, of course, this raised the whole question of judges being prepared to uh, interpret the law liberally. And in, in, in South Africa, uh, there were many uh, liberal judges or judges who were not necessarily politically liberal, but who were determined to uphold the principles of the common law. And so they did interpret the law uh, benevolently where it was possible to do so. So as a lawyer, one could always appeal to uh, the courts for a uh, benevolent human rights approach to uh, the interpretation of the law. So uh, South African law was fairly unusual in that respect. And uh, in the uh, 1980s, uh, public interest law became very prevalent in South Africa. There were a number of institutions which provided uh, free legal aid to uh, people who opposed apartheid or suffered under apartheid. And so the courts were kept busy with legal arguments. And uh, the whole human rights debate was obviously influenced by the international uh, community and by the United Nations Charter. South Africa was a party to the UN Charter. In the UN Charter, it was a, committed itself to respect for human rights. And so one could appeal to that politically and on occasion even in courts of law. I remember arguing cases in courts of law in South Africa, in which I appealed to the UN Charter. This wasn't a very popular argument, but nevertheless, it could be done. Uh, and of course, uh, South Africa was subjected to uh, sanctions and to uh, condemnation by the international community for applying international law. So uh, uh, that, I believe, was, I think it was essentially the change in the attitude of civil society towards apartheid that uh, influence states and the United Nations to uh, take a firmer attitude towards South Africa. And this ultimately resulted in the uh, change in South Africa. Um, the next is a bit of an unfair question, but because probably you need both sides. But if we put a weight on international pressure on South Africa and the change of local civil society and the local idea of what it means to be South African and what South Africa is as a state, uh, um, you know, the change in the in the ruling elite, which one was more important? I think both were important factors. I think the, the, the change in civil society internationally was very important because uh, uh, many uh, the general public in many states uh, went along with the sanctioning of South Africa. And so South Africa was subjected to economic sanctions, to cultural sanctions, to sports boycotts. Sports boycotts were very, were very important. And so international civil society played an important role. Within South Africa itself, uh, civil society played an important role. And then, of course, there were uh, trade unions which uh, vigorously opposed the government. And then there was the uh, African National Congress, the Pan-Africanist Congress in exile that engaged in military activities uh, on the border and to some extent within the country itself in the form of acts of sabotage. So uh, there, there were many factors which brought, brought change in South Africa, but uh, international public opinion certainly played a part. Okay, now let's move to Palestine. And um, so you've experienced in you have got experiences in both states. You grew up in South Africa, and then you were in your career often in charge of um, of looking at Palestine and the plight of the Palestinians. And you have described yourself Israel as an apartheid state. If we take South Africa back in the nineteen seventies as a as a measure 
one to 100, zero to 100, how much, how, how apart height is Israel today? If you... Well, that, that's a difficult question to uh, answer. I, I have argued that the uh, policy and practice of apartheid in the occupied Palestinian territory is worse than it was in South Africa. But this has to be qualified because in some respects uh, it was not as bad, in some respects it is worse. For instance, if you take the way in which Israel has enforced its occupation, which is its policy of apartheid in respect of Gaza, that was never done in South Africa. South Africa never bombed uh, black uh, townships or black areas. Uh, so that was that's a particularly uh, particular phenomenon of the conflict in uh, Israel uh, Palestine and uh, I think racial discrimination racial segregation is more pronounced in uh, the occupied Palestinian territory than it was in, in South Africa South Africa there was a considerable amount of racial mixing in South Africa whereas in the occupied Palestinian territory you have a total segregation, separation between settlers and the Israeli military forces on the one hand and Palestinians on the other. There's no social uh, connection between the two uh, communities and there's uh, complete segregation. Uh, for instance, in uh, the occupied Palestinian territory, you have separate roads for settlers. Uh, we never had apartheid roads uh, in South Africa. So there are cases in which the segregation is infinitely worse in South Af in uh, Palestine than it ever was in South Africa. I think the important thing to stress is that in South Africa, segregation uh, was uh, very bad in the 1960s, 1970s, when the government set about trying to establish an apartheid state. But thereafter, in the late 70s and 80s, as South Africa was subjected to international pressure for change and uh, international public opinion uh, was very opposed to apartheid in South Africa. And so the South African government started to change and to look for ways and means to ameliorate the situation. Whereas in Israel-Palestine, you see the exact opposite happening, that the situation is gradually getting worse and worse. And one of the reasons for this, or perhaps the main reason, is that essentially the West, particularly the United States, supports Israel. And so you have a situation in which the international community is generally opposed to uh, what is happening in uh, the occupied Palestinian territory and in Israel itself. But uh, the United States uses its veto vigorously and on every occasion to prevent action from being taken against uh, uh, Israel. And uh, the United Kingdom is no better. Canada is likewise uh, very much in favor of Israel. Australia and its new government is a better place. And then Western European countries uh, are also determined to support Israel. Many of them suffer from uh, Holocaust uh, guilt. Uh, Germany and the Netherlands uh, are particularly subject to uh, Holocaust guilt and uh, they, they tend to uh, support Israel when uh, they should not do so. But uh, I think this is the the great difference between apartheid South Africa and what is happening in Israel. In the case of apartheid South Africa, international public opinion was firmly opposed to uh, apartheid in South Africa, particularly uh, after the, uh, from the late 1970s. Whereas in the case of Israel, the West is still determined to uh, support Israel. 
you think it has something to do with this perception that the South African case was clearly a colonial issue, you know, white colonialists uh, trying to take away the lands of a of an indigenous people, whereas in Israel, the entire conflict is not framed as such, although it is exactly that. It is white settlers taking away the lands of a brown people and doing so at impunity and saying we have the right to do so because here's an old book that says that this is ours, which is um, actually, funnily enough, a very similar argument to what China uses in the South China Sea to argue that it has the right to occupy these features in the in the in the South China Sea. Um, has it something to do with that, with this perception of Israel not being a colonial state? Well, of course, Israel is a colonial state. The whole settler enterprise is a colonial, colonial enterprise. It's the worst form of colonialism in which the Israeli Jewish settlers uh, have occupied a territory and exploited it and subjected the indigenous population to multiple human rights violations. So it's a clear case of colonialism. And what is, is very interesting is that the states that support Israel are by and large ex-colonial powers. The United States, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand to a lesser extent, the Netherlands, these are all states with a colonial past. And so one can almost suggest that these states do not see the settler regime in occupied Palestine in the same light as other states see it because they see it through the eyes of the colonial power. And in effect, they're saying, well, we behaved in much the same way. What's wrong with it? And so uh, they refuse to accept that uh, the settler enterprise is a colonial regime and that Israel is in fact engaged in a form of colonialism coupled with a form of apartheid. And I think colonialism generally resulted in a form of uh, racial segregation, which the uh, citizens of the colonial power were uh, accorded privileged uh, positions and the indigenous people were subjected to uh, violations of their human rights. And so the same thing is happening in uh, Palestine. Now, uh, in a sense, it's even worse now for the Palestinians than what it was in South Africa. I mean, in South Africa, the black population was at least part and citizens of a, a recognized state. So the state had an obligation to, under international law towards these citizens. Whereas for the Palestinians, the Israelis had tried to have it both ways of saying all of this is ours, but the, the part with the, with the people who we don't like, the biggest part where 2.2 million people, Palestinians live, is not part of our, of our territory. Therefore, we have no state obligations. Therefore, we can bomb them whenever we want because we couldn't bomb our own citizens, but they're not our citizens, therefore we can bomb them. Um, do you see any way out under the framework of international law uh, of this horrible situation? Well, just let me correct you on the South African situation. The uh, South African government was aware of this uh, problem of citizenship. And so in the... Uh, 60s, 70s, it embarked upon a policy of creating uh, Bantu stands, independent homeland states for Africans. So you had in South Africa four so called independent states, which were carved out of South Africa. And in these territories, which were part of South Africa, uh, Africans were uh, deprived of their South African citizenship mm -hmm. and accorded the citizenship of a bunch of stand such as uh, Transkai or Siskai. Uh, so South Africa argued that, well, it's not our responsibility to uh, protect these people. But in fact, South Africa did uh, prop up these states, uh, provided uh, for them, uh, it set up schools, universities, hospitals, industrial areas in the uh, Bantustans 
in order to uh, look after the welfare of the local people. But to return to the subject of uh, Palestine, it's not true that Israel is uh, free to behave as it likes towards Palestinians. It is bound by humanitarian law, particularly by the Fourth Geneva Convention, which deals with the way in which states are to behave in respect of occupied territories. And one of the main uh, provisions in that uh, convention is that a state, an occupying state, may not transfer its own citizens into the occupied territory. Uh, this was a provision which was introduced in 1949 in response to the practice of Nazi Germany of settling uh, Germans in uh, neighboring territories. And so the Fourth Geneva Convention is very clear, but despite this provision, Israel has uh, established a colonial empire in the uh, occupied Palestinian territory with some 700 to 800,000 uh, Israeli Jewish uh, citizens. And of course, the uh, Fourth Geneva Convention also provides for the uh, welfare, the occupying powers obliged to provide for the welfare and uh, good treatment of the local population. So Israel is subject to many obligations and the uh, irony is that Israel wished to portray itself as a uh, human rights uh, oriented state and so it has signed most of the human rights conventions uh, such as the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Economic and Social Rights, Convention on Race Discrimination, Convention Against Torture, Rights of the Child Convention, said Israel is a party to all these conventions. And uh, Israel argues, well, these conventions only uh, apply to our treatment of people in Israel itself. But the International Court has held and the international community accepts that uh, these obligations are binding on Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory as well. So. Uh, Israel has violated international law to a far greater degree than apartheid South Africa ever did. It's interesting to note that apartheid South Africa carefully, deliberately refused to become a party to any of these uh, human rights conventions because it knew it would be held accountable. Uh, Israel has signed them and it is accountable. So Israel is subject to a much uh, stricter legal regime, international law regime, than uh, South Africa was. And, and of course, th this is uh, what makes the uh, comparison even more troubling, that uh, South Africa was not subject to so many human rights rules as uh, Israel is, and yet the international community has, in effect, given uh, all the Western powers have in effect given Israel a free pass to do what it likes without regard to the human rights conventions. Doesn't that lead to the very sad conclusion that international law, at the end of the day, when poli very strong political interests are involved, just doesn't work? <clears throat> well, the problem is particularly uh, prevalent in the United States, where both President Biden and Secretary of State Anthony Blinken repeatedly use this term. Uh, President Biden uh, hardly ever uses the term international law. He always refers to the rules-based order. Uh, Anthony Blinken is perhaps a bit better, but he also mainly refers to the rules-based uh, international order. Uh, Western leaders also frequently uh, use this term. Uh, so it is one that uh, is used frequently today. And uh, the question that I explored in my article is why the use of this term? And I can't quite understand why Western leaders, other than those of the United States, use this term. 
because they have uh, committed themselves to most multilateral uh, international law treaties and they accept customary international law and they accept the uh, rules of the United Nations and the uh, general interpretations placed on customary international law. But when it comes to the United States, the situation is different because there are good reasons why the United States might prefer to use the term rule-based international order rather than international law. <clears throat> and here I can uh, advance three reasons there. First of all, there's the fact that uh, the United States is not a party to uh, many basic fundamental multilateral treaties. Take, for instance, the uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea. The United States is not a party to this convention. And that explains why Secretary of State Blinken repeatedly uh, calls on China to observe the rule-based order in respect of the South China Sea. It's because he cannot appeal to the Law of the Sea Convention. And there are other important conventions, particularly those governing uh, human rights or humanitarian law. So, for instance, the United States is not a party to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court nor is it a party to the 1977 Geneva Protocols, which uh, deal with uh, the laws of war. It is not a party to the uh, Convention on Cluster Munitions or uh, anti-personnel mines. And so the United States is uh, really uh, out of the main loop, so to speak, when it comes to uh, multilateral treaties. We, we saw this recently, incidentally, in the case of the United States decision to provide uh, cluster munitions to Ukraine. Uh, this was a very difficult question for many Western European states because they are all party to the uh, cluster munitions convention, whereas the United States uh, is not. And there are other conventions, such as the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is a basic human rights convention. So the United States is not a party to many multilateral treaties. Independent enough. The court isn't politically independent enough to actually do its work. It, yes, it's, it's not independent or, or powerful, but it's influenced, again, by the, the major donors, uh, yes which uh, are mainly Western powers, with the exception of Japan, which is a, a major donor of the ICC. But it's the Western powers which call the shots. You know, Professor Duga, I think to me, to end on a positive note, this just proves that international law is not good enough yet. Um, it is probably the best chance for the Palestinians to ever get to the the justice that they deserve but it is definitely not good enough to serve that purpose and also to serve the purpose of universality and universal uh, law that is above um above politics um but that doesn't mean that we can't get there i mean international law hugo grotius it's about 400 years maybe we just need another 400 but we're on the way maybe well the problem is not international law there or clear rules of international law which govern virtually every situation. The problem is the enforcement. The mechanisms. And uh, the, uh, the International Court of Justice, as I indicated, is uh, only uh, applicable in respect of states that have accepted the jurisdiction of the court. There is now, of course, an advisory opinion that has been requested uh, of the International Court uh, on Palestine. The court has been asked to pronounce in effect on the legality of the occupation, having regard to the uh, 
annexation of uh, Palestinian territory, the prolonged occupation, and the discriminatory measures, including apartheid, that Israel is applying. So the International Court will pronounce on uh, these issues uh, at the beginning of next year. But it, that will be an advisory opinion, and uh, whether the Western powers will uh, accept the opinion uh, is an open question. Well, I think the answer is that they will accept it if it's the answer they want. And if it's the answer they don't want, they will they will just either be quiet or even say that they, they outrightly reject it, right? Um, one of the two. Yes, I think the uh, you, you're absolutely correct in that respect. The, the problem remains, however, that states do not uh, determine the views of civil society. Yes. Uh, I think the difficulty with politicians is that no Western politician can survive an accusation of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And so every Western politician, particularly in the United States or the United Kingdom, or Germany or the Netherlands, can afford to be accused of uh, being soft on Israel, or rather being soft on the Palestinians, being favorable towards the Palestinians, because that is labeled as anti-Semitism. And uh, politicians are very vulnerable to accusations of anti-Semitism. But one sees the attitude of civil society in Western countries changing in respect of the uh, Palestinian cause. And I think ultimately governments will have to except that they are subject to the views of civil society because their electoral success depends on that. So uh, I remain fairly hopeful that uh, in the long run, but it's a very long run, uh, justice will prevail. I hope so too. And I think these are beautiful words to end this discussion. Professor uh, Dugar, thank you very much for taking the time today. Thank you very much, Pascal, for inviting me to be in a very, very interesting exchange of uh, views. Thank you.